Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is uh, JD Stahl. I head up partner management at uh, Nine for the Americas, and I'm very excited uh, about today's uh, webinar that is uh, going to be co-presented by two of Nine's partners, um, Clarkson Consulting, um, as well as uh, Theobald Software. Um, and the topic for today is about uh, SAP and, and analytics um, and adjusting sales forecasts to disruptions. Um, like we had a big disruption, as we all know, with, with COVID. So it's um, like seeing how those kind of things are, are impacting uh, some analytics analytic models. So before um, I'm going to introduce you to, uh, to the speakers, um, uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, items. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, so first of all, um, right? If uh, if you're running into any technical issues in the in the header, you see the FAQ um, that might give you some uh, some guidance. And then if somehow you get lost, then a good way to always get back is uh, just clicking on the session in the uh, in in the header. So then the um, the other thing is, um, in case you have any questions, uh, we will have an FAQ uh, session at the, or FAQ. We have a Q and A session at the at the end. Um, so for the speakers to answer any any questions, um, but for you to um, if you have any questions, there's a, a Q and A section on the right side of your of your screen. If you click that button um, that you see out there, um, raise a question there. We have uh, folks from the different um, the different partners um, and NIME as well um, to answer those. Um, and uh, if they're not answered, then we'll pick them up at the end of the of the session. So with that, um, I want to start introducing to the uh, to the speakers. Um, so welcome, Jason and Christoph. Hi there. Do you just uh, want to give a quick intro? Hi there. Sure. So hi everybody. My name is Jason Kearns. I'm a senior consultant with Clarkson Consulting. I've uh, been with the firm for about eight years, and my background is in industrial and systems engineering. Um, with Clarkson, uh, my focus is on supply chain and then data and collaborating with our analytics team. So I'm excited to be speaking with you all today. Hello, everyone. My name is Christoph Schuler. I'm the regional manager for the Americas uh, at Teobalt Software, based in Seattle, Washington. Thanks, and excited to have uh, both of you join, and excited also about uh, gr the great partnership that we have with uh, with with both of you. Um, in terms of the agenda, um, what we're going to do, Jason is going to start off with setting the scene in terms of like the the case study that we have for you. Um, then Christoph is going to talk about um, like how with Theobald Software you can take data out of uh, out of SAP. Um, Jason going to going to pick it up from there and talk about some of the modeling, um, like based on the expertise that uh, Clarkson has. Um, and and using a tool uh, like our, our our Nime solution as part of that, um, and then um, Christoph is going to pick it back up again to show okay how to like take whatever the data that we have and then uh, get that back into into SAP, um, and then from there we uh, after that we have our our Q and A Q and A session. So with uh, with that, um, Jason, just hand it off to you. Awesome, thank you. Just flip the slide here. So I'll start with a little bit of an introduction on Clarkson Consulting for those of you who aren't familiar with our firm. Um, we've been around since 1991 and uh, worked with global companies in solving very complex uh, business challenges. Um, we have a very uh, deep focus on industry expertise, specifically within the consumer products, life sciences and retail industries. And our services cut across a, a lot of different functional areas. Uh, as you can see on the right hand here, um, everything from like SAP implementations to strategy development, um, operations work and supply chain and quality to name a few. Um, and we really, really uh, focus and emphasize on our partnerships with our clients and, and try to, uh, uh, you know, Im implement those uh, solutions and, and uh, you know, drive business transformation um, through that. And our analytics team in particular uh, in our in our service, we like to call us the insights to actions team um, because we, we really go full cycle across a number of our different um, functional areas and, and partner with you know for example supply chain, uh, which we'll be getting into today, um, as well as you know sales and quality and so on and so forth. So here's a, a sample of some of our um, capabilities. Um, we really do you know full end to end 
everything from, you know, data operations and visualization and kind of more complex and advanced AI and machine learning. So, um, you know, excited to be able to introduce the firm to those of you who aren't familiar, um, but, uh, and uh, I'll hand it off to JG to talk a little bit about Nine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jason, for that. So, yeah, NIME, is, uh, as you can see, has been around for uh, for some time. Uh, we're headquartered in Switzerland, uh, but we have offices um, in, in Europe as well as uh, as, as the USA. Um, we have very close ties to the uh, um, to the university. We have a, a very uh, strong academic program. Um, and, uh, yeah, as you can see also with today's uh, webinar, um, we have a, a global network of partners, both on the services side, um, but also on the on the technology side. Um, not only that, we have a, a very big community, um, a very active community. Um, if you ever want to take a look at uh, forum.nime.com or hub.nime.com, you can see some of the things that um, right our community takes Nime to the to the next level. Um, so it's very interesting to see that um, and. The Nime uh, software, so our solutions, as you can see, it's it, it's it's um, um, it's being used um, across uh, all the different industries, um, different sizes of companies, and a, a lot of different use cases. Anything from from ETL to um, like um, advanced advanced analytics. Um, our um, platform, our software platform, consists of two parts. Like um, we have the Nime Analytics platform, which is our visual. Uh, for visual programming um, to, to to build analytics uh, analytic solutions, um, it's a free and open source. You can download it um, and has has no limitations in terms of like the um, like the data that you can access, the types of um, source you can access, etc. Um, so that's more on the on the desktop side. Um, then in order to um, like for our enterprises um, and like we have Nime Server, it's a commercial solution. Um, and with that, we can um, do anything from automation to governance um, to model management, et cetera. Um, and then also, of course, taking consideration the, the enterprise requirements in terms of like security and, and scalability. So with that, um, Christoph, back to you. All right. So a brief introduction about Tia Bolt Software. We've been around uh, over 15 years and we're an ISV, a software vendor, focused on SAP integration. So our goal is to develop, market, and support uh, ready-to-use SAP integration solutions that customers can install, uh, ideally with little effort and configuration required, uh, and, and by doing so, achieve their desired integration with the SAP environment. We've grown in these 15 plus years to about 3,200 SAP customers worldwide. Uh, our company is headquartered in Germany, in Stuttgart. So we've sort of grown organically uh, with the SAP market over the years uh, in Germany, in Europe. Uh, but in the last decade or so, we've also seen a uh, very good market share, both in the Americas as well as in Asia Pacific. We also have a partner network. Uh, first and foremost, we're an SAP partner. Uh, in fact, we're an SAP certified integration partner. Um, but we also partner with companies like Nime to make sure we offer <clears throat> the best possible integrations between our products and uh, those third-party environments. Back to Jason. Excellent. Thank you both for those intros. So at this point, I'm going to take a few minutes to set the scene, so to speak. So as uh, all of you, I'm sure, are well aware, you know, COVID-19 really disrupted um, a lot of things in our world and the demand for most products is, you know, a very tangible example of that. Um, when we think about forecasting, typically, uh, you know, you would rely on historical data to come up with a demand forecast for, for most or any product, really. Um, and so because the, you know, with all of the uh, shutdowns, the businesses and travel and just changes in consumer patterns and, and buying and, you know, uh, every, every implication that this pandemic has uh, had across the world, um, the, obviously the 2020 data set of demand looks probably very different for most products than previous years and perhaps years to come. Um, you know, for those of you that are on SAP, either ECC or S4, you know, the, the basic kind of out of the box, right, um, vanilla 
uh, forecasting capabilities, uh, you know, are there, but they're not particularly sophisticated. Um, and really just relying on historical data um, is, is and some kind of simple forecasting techniques, which you can apply. But um, when we get disrupted by something like COVID, that's going to change our demand pattern and make that historical data uh, maybe not relevant going forward, right? So um, short of uh, implementing a, an advanced planning solution, you know, such as IBP or, you know, Agility, can access Blue Yonder to name a few. Um, there's many, many out there. Um, and you know, frankly, even if you do have an advanced planning tool, there is a need to do uh, more specific analysis to identify uh, what to expect going forward, um, which, you know, most of those tools really can't support without a whole lot of uh, customization at, at the best, right? So um, there is another way, and we're excited, you know, with the partnership here with NIME and, and with Theobald as well, to extract SAP data, um, analyze it, and come up with better forecast models using the NIME platform, uh, and then actually make that actionable. So uh, excited to, to take you through just the, you know, one particular use case of going through that exercise there are many but i think you know just being so tangible in front of mind for for most you know individuals and businesses this COVID example of this man disrupt demand disruption is a great use case so i'm going to let uh christoph talk about uh, you know how theobald enables you to get demand data or other data for that matter out of sap and then i'll talk about uh some of the modeling that we've we've done to, uh to prepare for this um webinar today so back to you christoph all right. So here you see an overview of our solution to connect NIME with SAP data. If we start at the bottom of this slide, you will have access to any of your SAP systems uh, in, in your SAP landscape. Uh, for example, uh, for most of our customers, access to SAP ECC or S4HANA is very important. You can also access data in any other ABAP or NetWeaver-based SAP system. That includes uh, systems like SAP Business Warehouse or BW, also SAP CRM, SRM, uh, etc. Now, Extract Universal, our tool, enables centralized data access for your SAP system. So you can manage, configure, secure everything in one place centrally and then uh, make that functionality and those data extracts available in the NIME platform. So Extract Universal acts as the intermediary between your SAP landscape and the NIME platform. With the built-in connectors or data extractors, you see the nine components uh, shown here, you will have access to any data in SAP, regardless of the module uh, or version of your SAP application. The different extractors work with different interfaces and various source objects in SAP, including tables, views, reports, et cetera. And they enable both full and incremental or delta data feeds. And for a forecast uh, scenario, uh, as Jason has uh, given us an introduction about, um, you can have access to uh, data such as bill of materials, inventory, item supply, open sales orders, production orders, or purchase orders. These are all common data points for the purpose of forecasting. The data is then made available in the NIME platform through the SAP reader node. You see it shown at the top of this slide. And I will show you a brief demonstration here uh, in a moment. Uh, this is a node that was developed by the NIME team in partnership with us. The data flow is direct, uh, meaning there is no interim data store or database involved. Uh, so the data is extracted from SAP and then sent directly into the NIME workflow. And then you can work with this SAP data um, in, in any other node uh, in, in the NIME platform. So let's switch over to uh, the demo environment and I'll briefly show you how it works. You see here the NIME analytics platform and I have included in my workflow the SAP reader node that I just talked about. And I'm going to kick off a data extract here with a simple output uh, to a CSV file. 
Behind this reader node sits our tool that I just described, Extract Universal. You see here the UI for the tool. This allows you to um, manage all your data extracts, create data extracts with the different components, uh, connecting to tables, queries, reports, function modules, all kinds of source objects in SAP. What I'm showing you here in the demo is a simple data extract from a sales data. Uh, this is sales order data um, that we're pulling using the table extractor. On the NIME node, you have the option to query all the data extracts that are available to you that are exposed by our tool uh, into the NIME node. So here I've selected my sales document header data extract. I have some other options for authentication. Uh, I could also pass in filter parameters, for instance. Um, and I can now simply execute this node. Uh, and then it can the data can be further utilized um, in your NIME workflow. Back to Jason. Awesome. Thanks for taking us through that, Christoph. So I think just before I jump into some of the approach that we've taken to, to build some of these models for this demo, um, I think the in the past, you know, getting data out of SAP has been a pain point for a lot of companies. And I think there's still a perception for a lot of people that it just it's not possible, right, to, to extract that data and manipulate it in a, in, without a whole lot of um, effort. So it's exciting that, you know, as we just saw, there's an ability to do that. And then, you know, using a platform like NIME, um, you know, there's a lot of powerful things that, you know, your business can do. Um, so in this particular exercise here, you know, we were wondering what are the major factors impacting 2020 demand, right? So uh, taking that SAP data, so extracting sales orders and, and shipment data, uh, as well as, you know, some forecast information, uh, you know, using the Theobald connector, um, and then being able to combine that with external data sets is something that you can't do directly in, you know, as the ECC or S4, right? So um, we thought it would be interesting to look at some COVID data that's publicly available. So things like uh, in the U.S., like the, the various states publish information on test results of positive cases, negative cases, trends around that hospitalizations, including you know, the number of ICU beds that are filled, deaths unfortunately, uh, as well as some key dates, right? So um, things that like on a state by state level, um, you know, declaration of emergency or travel restrictions, like what was the date where everyone was on lockdown? You know, did businesses get shut down on a particular date for non-essential businesses? Um, and, you know, on a state by state level, there were some other uh, interesting events or regulations that we were able to pull those in. Um, we also thought it would be interesting to look at employment data, so unemployment rates and, you know, as, as a percentage and uh, outright uh, can comparison with the population. Um, all of this is to put a bunch of data into a model and try to understand where those, uh, what those impacts were from external forces on our demand, right, as a company. So, um, there are plenty of other examples of, of external data sets that you could use uh, to, to do this sort of modeling exercise. Some common things that uh, some of our clients are looking at these days are um, weather patterns or forecasts, like specific holidays, and demand planning and planning in general. You can look at things like, you know, promotions or like social media um, activity and any other kind of demand shaping uh, activities that your company might be taking on on the sales side. Um, so there's there's lots of possibilities. I just want to highlight that, like for this exercise, we wanted to take something again that's like a tangible kind of straightforward example um, and see uh, when we combine these data sets using Theobald to get the SAP data out, using NIME to combine in these other external data sets we get in a, a spreadsheet or uh, Excel or flat file format. Um, what do we come up with, right? So how does that inform how to how to um, prepare and plan our company and our operations going forward. So um, that was sort of the the um, approach in terms of getting the data. Um, so 
So first thing we like to do, you know, once we once we pull all this data together, um, and I'll talk about the the actual model and like how we how we have done that um, using Nine to enable that activity. Um, but uh, what we did was for one of our um, clients, a large international um, consumer goods company that makes common household products. Um, we we took a, a you know a high volume product in aluminum foil in this example. Um, and focus just for these charts, at least on a, a you know a high volume uh, region, which is the state of California. Um, and uh, just let's first thing let's let's look at this right. So these line plots uh, generated from Nime, uh, showing shipments on the top and just the number of ICU patients on the bottom. It starts to paint a picture, right? So there's obviously uh, tons of uh, additional analysis we want to do, but. Um, to sort of say, okay, yeah, there's something going on here, right? Where we see um, in in that you know March to April range, there's a spike in demand. We see a spike in the number of you know patients in ICU beds in California, which um, it does align with these two lines that we've shown here, right? So March 13th was the official stay-at-home order, uh, and by April 30th, non-essential businesses were ordered to close. Um, so. For this particular product, aluminum foil, um, you know, there there was seems to be a spike in people, you know, shifting towards staying at home, uh, maybe cooking or baking more than they they might have otherwise been. We see a shift in patterns and consumer behavior is another way of saying that. Um, and then you know the demand clearly seems to have outstripped the supply, where we see a gap of no shipments happening, and then a whole other spike of that backlog, right? So demand that and when we look at our historical trend over the last couple of years you know we we see those demand patterns are much more stable of course there is some seasonality around the end of the years we would expect you know holidays people baking that sort of thing makes sense right um and then you know we get to 2020 and of course everything goes out the window right which you know for this particular product i think um it, it's just a very tangible example of something that most people have in their kitchen um and that, you know, it, we can see in the data something that an anecdotally, you know, being locked down in Los Angeles, I can attest for uh, that March to April period was, was very strange and, you know, people making runs on uh, grocery stores, et cetera. So this is one product, of course, one particular item for one company. So then the question remains, like, what about everything else? So not all products are created equal, as you know. Um, I'll give an example of another one of our clients, a medical device manufacturer, um, which made uh, surgical equipment for eye surgery, it's ophthalmology, right? So their uh, patients were primarily, um, the procedures were mostly elective and those got shut down, right? For the most part in, in the US at least um, during COVID. So that demand doesn't go away, it just gets deferred or pushed out, right? something like uh, Cam's Good Manufacturer, some of our self-stable self food um, manufacturing clients um, see, saw huge spikes in, in their demand for certain products. Um, but, you know, it's really, you have to go case by case to understand, like, is that a shift, a, a permanent shift in behavior? Did people all of a sudden start buying a new product that they hadn't had before because there was a huge run on grocery stores and there wasn't a whole lot on the shelves, so you bought what you could? And all, all of a sudden that's going to be a part of those consumers diets, or is it something where there's a huge spike and then that's all just going to sit there for a few years. Um, it really is. It, you got to get granular and, and understand um, like how to segment out your portfolio on a, you know, product by product or by customer, uh, whatever level of granularity is appropriate. Um, and so using this type of um, analysis, this type of technique can really do that uh, with, with NIME. So, you know, the question that's looming, I'm sure, in, in most of our minds is like, well, OK, that's all great. Like, we're not fully out of the woods yet with the pandemic, particularly in a lot of countries that don't, maybe don't have access to the vaccine or with all these different variants that are popping up. So a lot of unknowns. So what do we expect in 2021 and beyond? And that is where we can um leverage a model and a platform like Nime to do some of that analysis and really put some intelligence behind our forecast and our and build better models going forward. So this is a 
you know, high level kind of screenshot of the model that we, you know, had put together for this, uh, for this exercise. Um, there's really a, several models within this, but there's a couple of different techniques that I'm going to take us through that I think kind of highlight some of the capabilities of, of NIME, which frankly is, you know, an expansive and, and very effective tool for doing these kinds of analyses um, on a, you know, either a, a event driven basis or on an ongoing basis, you know, you can really do some, some simple analysis or more complex business processes to enable your forecasting process. So um, the first thing we do is, is merge in uh, that SAP data, which we've extracted through FIAVOLD connectors um, with some of those external uh, COVID data sets, do some, some wrangling, right? Do a little bit of filtering in this case, uh, looking at the California subset of the data. Um, you know, you want to cut out things like uh, correlated values. So if it's just a redundant field in terms of, uh, you know, mathematically how the, the fields relate to each other, um, you know, we won't look at that statistic necessarily. Um, and then you can basically develop a, a base, you know, do some exploratory analysis, develop a baseline model. And then in this bottom box, we'll talk about a specific uh, model that is relevant to COVID um, and trying to figure out when we are out of the woods, so to speak. So I'm going to talk about, you know, the first step we would do on in really most data uh, analytics projects um, is just really explore the data. So like what, try to figure out what, what are we looking at? So, um, you know, this, uh, this node here is this kind of expanded. We'll see, you know, a couple of the other, I'll just highlight a couple of the, the cool nine nodes that are available to your data scientists or to your business analysts um, who would be putting these types of models together. Um, you know, the, the SMOAT one is, uh, you know, enriching your data, um, trying to make sure there's um, balance in the, the sample of, of different uh, different types of values that are represented. The auto ML is, you know, automatically um, running through uh, a number of machine learning models and that kind of end to end cycle and trying to basically figure out what um, what models are most appropriate to, to represent the data. And then the outputs of these uh, like box plots or line plots, there's some visualizations to just, again, try to get our feet under us in terms of what are we even looking at with this data. Um, in this particular example, we're looking at like where shortages occur on the supply side. Um, and, you know, there's a few different techniques. I mentioned the box plots, you know, we're trying to, um, if with the feature importance, like train those, identify where those uh, points are. Um, you can do a, a line plot comparison, comparing those features. Um, and then the bottom node here on the left, you know, trying to um, understand what's um, basically um, in the post COVID like world, what does that look like? What is your post start of COVID, I should say. So like mid COVID, like how has our data changed? How has our demand signal changed after the pandemic and all the regulations and the, you know, the uh, locations, consumer behavior changing, people working from home, all of that feeds into a change in your demand signal. So we try to understand what are we looking at? And we have all these different techniques. There's, there's, you know, many other approaches that you can take. This is just a simple example of, um, again, what your analysts or data scientists um, could put together. Um, you know, and from there we want to build a baseline model. So we uh, take all this information and we, we're basically, again, trying to predict what are people going to order in the future, right? So what do we expect in 2021 and beyond? Um, and so, you know, this is the most straightforward baseline solution is just to, to run like these uh, forest learners um, and kind of come up with a uh, a measurement of accuracy. So like, you partition the data out and you let these uh, random forest learners provide us with like what the expected order quantities are. Um, since that's a number, just, just to clarify that, we call that a regression, right? Um, and then we have accuracy metrics. Now you can uh, from there actually go further and use some techniques to tune the model um, using some of the insights from your exploration um and then like the performance of that baseline so it's, it's easier to 
basically tune up a uh, existing model than to create something from scratch. So that's where we, you know, we feed it some of those other data points. Um, and all of this is just to give you a better model of what your forward looking demand is going to look like. Uh, again, some these are techniques that are, um, you know, for an analyst or, or data scientist, like fairly easy and straightforward to implement in NIME, um, particularly because it's no code or low code, right? You can just drag these nodes in and um, see that data getting manipulated along the way. Um, but uh, it's, it's much more um, useful and insightful than anything that you can do just like in kind of standard SAP um, in the system. And then uh, for this COVID example, we want to identify, like, I think the question that everyone has is like, wh where did the, where did, when did the demand start shifting? Uh, so when did COVID start in air quotes, right? Uh, when did it stop? Did it actually stop at all? Um, are, are we going to return to normal patterns of demand as in, you know, in the, the time leading up before the pandemic? Is it going to look different going forward? Is, uh, is that data that we've had in terms of historical demand patterns and sales orders and shipments and whatever, is that useful? Is that even relevant to our forward looking forecast? Can we use it, right? So what this particular model here does is it observes the performance across a, a date range and it's trying to identify at what point, um, at what point in that date range does the new demand signal the new pattern like break from the historical trend right so in this part particular example we're using a, a measurement called cohen's kappa um, which really is just a measurement of accuracy that's adjusted for um, randomness so what we see here is uh, that around that April, mid mid to late April timeframe, we have a peak in that particular statistic, which shows us that like, yeah, that is when COVID quote unquote started in California for that product, which again, lines up with what we see in some of the other data sets um, that we've merged in. So the this technique can be used to, um, and, and I guess I should call out that uh, like in this particular measurement like a higher value in this conus kappa um, implies like that like split point right where there's a difference between the data set before and what we're seeing after that so what you would do is continue to run this going forward um, to understand when are we out of the woods like if at all and maybe you are maybe you aren't i mean we're basically trying to figure out like what's what do I do going forward? Do I typically, you know, you would want to use at least three years of historical forecast to come up with your, um, your or historical demand to come up with your forecast. And when we have a chunk of time, you know, be it a few months or a few years, probably depending on the product um, with COVID, uh, we have a chunk of time that just is a, it's anomalous. It doesn't really jive with the rest. It, it's it's its own thing. We see that mathematically it, it stands out. Do I do I just throw my whole history out? Do I just cut that 2020 period out? Do I adjust it somehow? Do we you know are there other techniques we can employ to uh, account for that? Um, there's a lot of questions. And again, it's it's case by case, product by product. You know. Uh, that you would want to make these types of um, decisions and, and going through and putting together some some quick and simple models like these can really help inform your business um, on, on how to proceed. Um, whereas, you know, just relying on your history alone, it's, it's just going to be a mess and you're going to get away from any kind of statistical, uh, meaningful statistical forecasting, most likely. So um, this, again, I just to, to kind of summarize, um, there's a number of um, really uh, simple and then really advanced techniques that you and your team can employ using a platform like NIME um, to put together uh, a more intelligent and a more uh, actionable forecast that's going to leave you in a better position to, to you know, plan your supply chain. Um, 
there are a number of collaboration tools. I, I know JG mentioned the NIME server. You know, there's the, the nice thing about NIME is because it's low code, no code, but it also does allow for the use of like R um, or Python to, to build out some more elaborate um, analyses and techniques. Um, your whole team can collaborate on that. So someone with like zero coding experience can be collaborating on this nine server platform with someone who's like a really seasoned data scientist to come and put some of these models together. Um, you can post like dashboards and things, obviously like protect them to, to the right people that need to see them. Um, but there's a lot that you can do um, with all this data. And the the most important part in, in some sense, right, is that you can actually take these updated, the outputs of these forecasting models that your team has developed and put them back into ESAP so that it's actually actionable to drive your supply planning and your purchasing and everything downstream uh, in your supply chain um, so that it's not just a, it's not just a academic exercise. It's something that you actually benefit from as a business and improve your performance going forward, even with all of the uncertainty that COVID has introduced and like who knows what, you know, the future holds. So this type of analysis and exercise can be just as valuable, um, you know, even not not during a pandemic as the, the driver. Um, again, I mentioned things like what weather patterns or, you know, holidays or whatever big shopping events, that kind of thing. Um, you know, there's there's lots that you can do and you can go very simple or you can go very complex with like the more complex, um, you know, AI or deep learning approaches if you've got more, um, you know, capable data, data scientists on your team. So all of that said, uh, getting the data back into SAP is super critical. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it back to uh, Christoph to talk about what, what and how that, like how that works and what that looks like. Thank you, Jason. Um, let's go to the slide actually, please, first before the demo, uh, just to give an overview of how this uh, data write back to SAP looks. Um, so as Jason mentioned, um, once you have the sales forecast, it is important to customers to bring that back into SAP, right? SAP ERP is the system that will drive uh, things like your production schedules, right? It will drive inventory management. It will drive the procurement of raw materials uh, for the production of goods and so forth. So that's actually very critical um, to, to have this data back in SAP um, because only then it becomes uh, actionable as, as, as Jason said. So in the example of forecast data, um, you can use um, our tool uh, for this purpose to upload data back into SAP. Uh, for forecast data, you can create what are called in SAP planned independent requirements. So SAP has a feature, it has an interface um, for the um, upload of, of these uh, independent requirements, which are in essence uh, sales, sales requirements or sales forecast numbers. For those of you who are familiar with this uh, area in SAP, the transaction is MD61. And I'll show it to you in a moment uh, in our SAP system. Um, in the forecast upload component that is available in the NIME platform, you can uh, specify certain uh, upload parameters, such as what is the requirements type uh, that, that is very specific to, to SAP. Is it make to stock planning with assembly, for example? Um, you can also specify the forecast interval. Is it a daily, weekly, or monthly forecast? And you can also run a simulation. The uh, component is actually fairly simple. It reads the forecast data from a file or data store. And then the data is uploaded <clears throat> directly to SAP as independent planned requirements through a command line tool. So let me switch over to the demo environment and I'll show you how this works. You see here, um, we have a file reader uh, input file. I will 
um, show you the data briefly. Okay, so the file structure for this uh, forecast data is, is fairly simple. We have four columns. Uh, the first one indicates uh, the period. Uh, in this case, it's a monthly forecast. So for each month, we have one record here. We then specify the material or product that we want to forecast in SAP. SAP also requires us to specify a plant uh, for this forecast and then the quantity that um, is our sales forecast number. The forecast upload uh, component then reads this file and uh, executes a command line, which sends the data directly um, to SAP. So let's reset this briefly and then run it. So this is relatively quick. And if we go into SAP, I can go into transaction MD61 or the display um, transaction MD63. These are our display, these are our planned independent requirements. I can then specify a material or product. The requirements type that I used in NIME, in this case, I'm choosing planning for final assembly. And then I can see the uploaded forecast numbers here for July, August, September, and October. So that was a, a brief example of, of how these numbers can uh, get uploaded back to SAP. And I'll turn it back to Jason again. Excellent. Thanks, Christoph. Um, so I think we've gone through, you know, taking the example of COVID, um, you know, getting data out of SAP, doing some um, exploration, analysis, and model development to provide uh, a better forecast signal for your operations and then like actually getting that back into SAP so you can use it. Um, and, uh, you know, I was excited to be able to share that today. I think at this point we'll, we'll open it up to any questions for the audience um, and uh, bring back Christoph and, and JG. So I uh, appreciate everyone's time and let's uh, talk through any questions you might've had. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Jason and Christoph, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for, um, for just giving us a little bit of insight and some uh, some really some some things that like your customers are and our customers are are really dealing with. Um, if there are any questions, uh, please put it in the in the Q and A in the in the chat. Um, so Jason, let, let me ask you. I mean, you're uh, right. Even in this this case, right, using Nime um, both on the data analysis side, um, but also for modeling and even some some reporting. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about like how NIME helps Clarkston and not only you, but also your, your customers? Yeah, I can speak to that. So there's a number of different use cases um, that we have implemented NIME um, for various pieces of, of projects, um, both within our analytics practice, as well as, you know, some of our other uh, not explicitly analytics projects. Um, so things like, uh, just simple data wrangling or mis manipulation, um, you know, for like a, to support an ETL process to you know, everything to that, to building out complex, sophisticated uh, models that you have some automation and it really um, drive a lot of, you know, business process improvements. Um, the nice thing that we really do like NIME, uh, do like about NIME is that because it, as I mentioned, it has that no code, low code um, interface. You don't have to be uh, a data scientist or you don't have to have a you know computer programming or engineering background um, in order to use it. Really, if you can describe something you want to achieve, you can figure out how to do it in NIME. And so that's very attractive um, and appealing to a lot of our clients. Um, I think that uh, we, we find ourselves using NIME uh, in, in our clients um, picking it up very quickly. Um, and, and so there's a lot of like small, small and large use cases that, um, you know, it, it comes into play and can really help even if just it's a, it's a spot analysis or it's a more complex solution. So like you said, everything, um, uh, 
you know, modeling to, to reporting. Um, and one other thing I, I would highlight is that because um, NIME does have this great like research team and it's plugged in with universities and things like it's, it's a dynamic platform, like it's constantly evolving. So, I mean, there's been cases where some of our clients will maybe build some complex node out using either I or Python and then you know, down the road, that actually becomes uh, a feature that's available to everyone on the NIME hub as a, as a node. So it's, uh, it's, it's very um, powerful. And I think that, you know, it, it's, um, there's lots of cases where our, our clients will, you know, find their own niche thing that they need done, and then it'll, it'll be supported or, you know, it can be built out by NIME. So I hope that answers that. Awesome. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. And I think the nice thing, like with SAP, definitely a enterprise platform. Um, right. So it's good to, to see like solutions like Theobald and also Nime, right, where we spend a lot of time in just making it enterprise ready, um, just from security and, and from scalability perspective, um, to, to have that in place. Um so and let me see, we have a question over here. Um, could it be possible to see in detail how it works, the data upload and SAP process on the Theobald side. Is there a specific XU object you use to carry out the task? So. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that question. Off? Yeah, for that component that I showed you, we actually developed a, a command line tool. Uh, it's forecast upload.exe uh, that takes the input file, the comma separated forecast data uh, that I briefly showed. Um, the, the tool is something we're happy to uh, share with you. Um, we deliver it as part of Extract Universal. Um, so I'm happy to uh, get in contact with you after the webinar if you're interested in trying it out. Um, underneath, if, if you're interested more from a technical point of view, uh, it calls what's called a Bapier function module in SAP. So we're using a certified approach to bring this data back uh, into SAP. Yeah, and the other thing, we will have a recording of this session. Um, so in the email that goes out, we'll also put uh, contact details um, both for, for Jason uh, and for Christoph. So you always can uh, can, can reach out to them. Um, so thanks for thanks for that question. Um, again, if any other questions, please put it in. Um, so Christoph, one other thing. So are there some, um, some, some best practices, right, that you're running into in order to get data out of SAP, uh, but also to then to put it back into? So uh, anything? Right, you can do and, and why it is so important to have a solution like Theobald as, as part of this in the, in the total picture. Yeah, I would highlight a, a few things that I think um, perhaps differentiate our solutions. Um, I think we're relatively easy and quick to implement. Most of our customers see results quickly in days or weeks, uh, certainly not months, right? And we are also um, uh, low touch uh, in SAP. Uh, and, and that, I think, speaks to a lot of business users and business analysts where they don't necessarily have to involve or get much involvement from their SAP and IT teams, right? Oftentimes, they don't know where to start or who to go to. Um, so there's a lot you can do with a tool without having to install anything in SAP, uh, and you just start with your user account. Um, and um, then we have um, uh, quite a bit of uh, best practices and information available for those of you interested on different data sources. Um, of course, most customers have a lot of data in SAP. Um, so our tools also provide a way to not just do full data replication and access, give access to large data sets, but you can also do incremental uh, data loads. And that's very important um, because sometimes all you need is just the new data or the data that has changed without pulling um, all the historic uh, and old data over and over again. Cool. Thank you for that. And Chris, we got another question in that I'm going to address to you. It says, could you explain a little bit more about applications of the Extract Universal widgets, for example, table versus ODP notes? Yeah, so one, one important thing I want to highlight is every connection, every access we make in SAP is at the application layer. OK, so we don't connect to the database. Uh, there are tools out there that do that. That is not our approach and hasn't been um, for a variety of reasons. But everything happens at the SAP application or ABAP layer. So we're always in the context of an SAP user. Uh, also in that security context of that SAP user. And we have access to um, 
uh, all the metadata in SAP, and, and we utilize that in our tool. And that doesn't necessarily mean it comes at, at, at a disadvantage for performance. Uh, for instance, the table component is, is very performant. Um, if I compare the two that you mentioned, table, very performant, very reliable. You can do table joins. Uh, the query is executed in the ABAP layer and then brings the results back. Um, but it is not always the best suited data source for the deltas or incremental data loads that I mentioned earlier. For those, we recommend you look at ODP. ODP is uh, for operational data provisioning. It's actually an SAP framework for data replication. Um, so it is, it, is in, it is available in the standard SAP system, and it provides you both delta options uh, to, to bring out delta information, as well as uh, full data replication. And it also has advantages on HANA-based systems. So if you're looking, or if you already have uh, S4 HANA, and you want to access CDS views or HANA analytical views, you can do so with the ODP component. Uh, that is the, one of the biggest advantages of that compared to the traditional table approach. Appreciate that. Um, I don't see any other questions. So with that, um, Jason and Christoph, I want to thank you both for uh, giving us a little bit more insights in, into what you're doing and the, the tools that, that, you, uh, that you have. Um, and then for everybody else, thank you for joining today. Um, as I mentioned, we'll make the recording available. Um, you, will, um, you will get an email about that and we'll make sure there's some contact details in there just in case you have some questions later on um, to either, either one of the speakers. So with that, um, wish you all a great rest of the day and thank you for joining. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.